That's what it is. It's the Wayne Bradley Show. That's what it is. It's the Wayne Bradley Show. And welcome to the Wayne Bradley Show, live on 9, 10 a.m., the Superstation, the future of radio. I'm back on a Monday. It's been a while. No basketball season left, I guess. UB season is over. And I'm back on live now. We get to go five days a week again, so it's good to be back. Hopefully we get back on this nice, consistent schedule. You know, it's kind of hard uh, placing it during basketball season, so... Looking forward to getting back on a regular basis, folks. Mondays will be the power hour from 7 to 8, and then during the rest of the week, 7 to 9 p.m. on 9, 10 a.m. your superstation, the future of radio. Want to give a one another condolence and say rest in peace to Cliff Russell as people say goodbye to him today. Uh, he will truly be missed. I know a lot of the listeners have been calling in and uh, seeing a lot of the things that were said on Facebook. He, he was a, a true giant in our community, and he will be missed. Uh, Keep his family in your prayers uh, in this tough time. So uh, God bless Cliff Russell, and thank you, sir, for being such a gentleman. Uh, the few times that we were on the show together, you were always um, fair, always willing to, um, you know, never make it about you, and you wanted the real answers, and I could always appreciate that. So uh, rest in peace, Cliff Russell, and, uh, you know, we're going to try to still do you proud. You're on 9, 10 a.m., your superstation. All right. So we got a lot to talk about tonight in this power hour. Uh, give us a call, 313-778-7600. Uh, we'll just go quickly through the topics. We're going to talk about uh, Donald Trump and him saying that he's willing to buck the NRA in terms of uh, the bump stock and uh, trying to bring in some gun reform. Do you think this is a good thing? How many folks that are listening think we need gun reform or gun control laws, or is it just a, a knee-jerk reaction to obviously the tragedy that happened down in Parkland? Um, We're going to talk a little bit about how these boycotts against the NRA have had a backfire effect and how they've actually galvanized conservatives. Uh, Memberships are going up. I saw a lot of people on my social media page saying they were renewing their membership to the NRA uh, because last week you had a bunch of companies all of a sudden, uh, the Deltas and the Hertz and and Enterprise Rent-A-Car and all these different people that were dropping their corporate partnerships with the NRA. You know, and these basically are uh, discounts and benefits handed down to its members. And so a lot of these, you know, based on the pressure of these, the, the protesters in particular, the young kids, which I made a post about this weekend, I did a video about and said that uh, it is, an, it's a totally different thing to have kids advocating on behalf of these gun rights Laws, And I think that on top of that, them being 16, 17, uh, and some possibly in 18, we're talking about new voters, younger voters that are going to be voting in 2018. Uh, and so while sometimes in certain issues uh, the kids have been ignored, this issue because it happened there and uh, this young man that I saw on TV, David Hogg, I, guess, I think his name is, it looks like he was made for TV uh, and he was one of the victims in that uh, tragedy in Parkland, and he's been coming out as a strong advocate for gun control laws. And, and again, I think that the bigger thing is that they're having the conversation that I haven't even seen broached upon in years uh, in politics. So I think it's, it's interesting to see the effect of young people and the fact they're using social media and all these different, the, the, the power of social media, folks. Uh, you know, I know for a lot of the old timers and the people even in politics that. Uh, did not come in in this somewhat in this generation of social media. Uh, social media has shown that it has the the force and the pressure to change things or to at least create discussions. And uh, I, I I can't be mad at that. Uh, in this kind of tragedy, to see kids uh, working and advocating on something I'm not you know in favor of, but I understand why they would. Uh, it's just been interesting to see, and they're making noise, and, and it's, it's affecting the bottom line. Uh, and see, to me, uh, you know, black folks, oh, we're paying attention to this, too, because this is what happened. The kids started protesting and put pressure on corporate entities to disassociate themselves from them. 
Now we're talking about people that go to travel to gun and knife shows and travel and want to take their family places, and they're saying they don't want the members of the NRA, who some of them actually support some of these gun control measures, I guess, um, they decided to disassociate their partnerships with them. And that's galvanized and made a lot of uh, conservatives upset. How do you feel about that? Do you think that that is the right way to approach it? Uh, is the corporate partnerships dissolving and uh, disassociating themselves, is that going to make the NRA change? Because at the end of the day, they still lobby uh, on behalf of and with Gun manufacturers. That's the bread and butter. It's not a corporate partnership for a discount at Hertz rental car or something like that. Uh, and I think that those are some of the things that you got to be, you know, be. You know, let's see what happens over the next couple weeks on that. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the comment Donald Trump made, also about the fact as he was criticizing uh, the police officers down there in um, in Florida, him saying that he would. Uh, running himself, and I know he literally didn't mean running, but he said he wanted to do something about it, and those police didn't. Uh, and I think that that is something um, that we're going to talk a little bit about. So, I mean, we got the phone. Looks like the phones are ringing. Looks like folks have something to say about all these different topics. So, we'll uh, we'll start going through some of these calls here in this Power Hour. I thank you guys uh, for calling in. All right. So let's go to uh, let's start off with Big Al. Who's called in? Big Al, thanks for calling in. Yeah, you know I had to call in, Wayne. You ain't. Uh, you haven't heard you talk about Michael Steele, man. Oh, you want to talk about Michael Steele? Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what, that's what I got to talk about. What, what I talked to you a couple months ago, about a month ago, about these people not listening to you in your own party. You see how they felt about your boy Michael Steele, didn't you? Well, I look at that as was a, it was an ignorant statement. I mean, he could feel that well, way. See, I'm going to tell you something. Remember when Bullock had that show and he told you, mm-hmm. I, I, I'm not going to try to harp too much on that. But remember he said, remember he, he threw out the um, he threw out the uh, analogy that, that somebody's a tool and when they get done with you, they're going to put you to the side. Mm-hmm. Uh, did, I, did I ring a bell for you over there? Um, well, I mean, Wayne? listen, people tell me that. I've, you know how many times people have told me things like that, and I understand. Uh, but I think that the but guy that, the guy that, that spoke up and said that, that yeah, he said it's CPAC, and this is one of the reasons why I really don't attend CPAC anymore because it's a different kind of crowd down there, one. Uh, and the guy was wrong, point blank, period. Uh, and he was condemned by uh, GOP officials, including Ronald, Romney to de- Ronald McDaniel today uh, in today. D.C. No, he did it today, though. That's what I'm saying. He did it today. You should have pulled the tech tech man up off the stage when he said it right then and there. They did. I no, wait a minute. Listen, they, they could, and Michael Steele was in the, in the, at CPAC when that happened. I mean, it was an ignorant statement. I can't, you, I don't, I'm not going to defend uh, ignorance. Uh, uh, I know you're not going to defend it, but what I'm trying to say is you're trying to reach out and try to get people to come over to your side. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, I'm a gentleman. I, I'm an African-American. I'm looking at it on TV, and like I told you before, Wayne, I, I'm neither Democrat nor Republican. I told you how I think about both parties. But I just want to know, you as a conservative, how do you even like people being around them kind of people? Well, I think that you have to be honest with yourself that p- there are people like that in both parties. But that guy was wrong. Well, every, every, parties, everyone everyone doesn't feel you, that I way. I yeah, I mean, that the guy spoke for himself, and it was an ignorant statement. Uh, it's been getting I got condemned. one more thing before I get off. Go ahead. With dealing with the NRA. Mm-hmm. Where was the NRA when Philando Steele got shot when he had the right to carry a firearm, but yet Steele, they never came No, they did, they did come up and speak up for Philando uh, Castile, but it was two or three days later, lo- longer than it, t- it should have taken. So I have no problem with pointing see, that out see, too, Big see, Al. See, I know you want to point it out, Wayne. I, I'm glad you like who you like, man. And like I said, you know, I don't have, I'm not knocking you for your for who you believe in, who you vote for, who you associate associate yourself with. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying, man. The reason why most people won't join that party is because of stuff like that. Because at the end of the day, I almost wanted to ring that dude's neck. But the only reason why I'm not really upset because think of I just think about a lot of stuff that that Mr. Steele said about the previous president. He we as African American people, we got to start to realize at the end of the day we got to come together. We got to work together. I know we got to work with other groups of people, mm-hmm. but if we can't come together and support our own, then we're gonna have a problem. 
That's a fair enough we analogy. We gotta support our own. I understand you when you say we need both people in both parties, mm-hmm. but at the end of the day, well, we I mean, listen, I, I don't have any problem on and even on issues and commonality with my counterparts, my black Democrat counterparts. I don't have a problem with that. I think that there are issues that, that and in terms of in terms of black people in general, we need to work together. In terms of business, economically, That's what I'm saying. We yeah, gotta I, work get, I get all that. I totally the agree. The only reason with you, why I brought yeah. that to you, the only reason why I brought that to you, Wayne, because I, me personally, a guy can't come and say that. Because when I look at a guy like Michael Steele, I look at his background, I look at his education. Mm-hmm. That guy's put in the work. So at the end of the day, when you disrespect somebody like that, even though I may not agree on his politics. I got to step up for him because that was a bunch of bull crap. And at the end of the day, somebody should have ran that dude on off the stage and probably down the street. Nah, I hear you. Nah, that's why, like I said, that's why I'm not not up at CPAC, man. Thanks a lot, Big Al. I appreciate that. Now, he's exactly right. Uh, He should have been rushed off the stage at that point, booed off, shamed off the stage. Uh, And that's, again, I I, (laughs) – That is no excuse for that, and he should have definitely been at least, at the very least, booed off that stage and asked to sit down for, after saying something that stupid. All right, let's go to Rick, who's on the line, who's been waiting. Rick, thanks for calling in. What's going on, Mr. Bradley? All right, how you doing? All right. Hey, listen, man, we can talk all we want to about gun control. Mm-hmm. They got the little, they listen, and I'm not prejudiced, but they got the little white kids, you know, out there like advocates and, you know, and now they keep making a perception that things is going to move and change. Mm-hmm. But it's not. Listen, man, I don't care if they, the, the, the little white kids do make get a point across, you know, and make everything move. Hey, Wayne, yes, they sir. still are going to make guns. No, you know I, 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 t- I totally agree. Uh, and, and, again, I think well, this is the thing, and I think that this is why people on both sides of the aisle need to take a deep breath and actually listen to what's being proposed out here uh, because you have some of these, even some of the victims are saying, obviously we don't want to take away all guns, but we need to improve the way that people are getting access to these guns, like people with mental health issues. Uh, and I think those are some of the things that instead of this hysteria, because that's what's going on here is that, and it's good for TV Listen, ratings, Wayne. good for radio, but that's not – no one's going to take the guns. They're going to keep making guns here in America. Uh, uh, gun Listen, owners here Listen. are here to stay. Listen here, Wayne. Another person I got a big problem with, mm-hmm. and I don't know if you – but you're smart, so you're going to pick – you might pick it up because it happened in Michigan, and I'm sure it happened in other states. Mm-hmm. When we had that uh, fat-haired John England. He closed down all these mental institutions in Michigan and Detroit and suburbs and had these people walking around like zombies. Well, I think, like I said, now, Rick, what I'll say on that issue is that uh, it's been a systemic issue that started with federal dollars. And then when we had these mental institutions, you had too many problems of abuse and you op- they opened up more community-based. Hey, well, listen, man, if they going to sit there and... Uh, we, but, we, I mean, we that is not a good solution. We just have to be honest now. 10, 15, well, we 20 years later. I'm going to be honest with you, Wayne, and I do not, I, I do not appreciate what England did. And I'm sure it happened or more around the, the United States. You know what I'm saying? Well, that's what, I was, that's what I was saying, that I, England just happened to be the governor at the time when that process began because uh, Jennifer Granholm didn't was, do anything to change it, it either. Word, it was his word that made it. He the one who made that happen. And I'm going I'm to say this, too, right here. Guns been here since we've been here. Mm-hmm. You know what's been been got more powerful, Wayne? What's that? Hate. Right. Hate. Hate makes the people pick up and kill somebody. The gun not going to jump up and kill nobody. You are it's exactly still, right. You're exactly right there, uh, Rick. got this racial bias around here where people seems to hate each other. And, hey, Wayne, I'm sure you look at social media. Mm-hmm. They got little white kids on there. 14 years old, 13 years old, dressed up in that practical stuff with long uh, machetes and with sawed-off shotguns. You know, talking about hate, spurring hate. Now, this has been taught to them. They didn't see their uncles and all them in the backyard. Do see, that's what I'm saying. It's repetition. You know, um, prejudices, you know, that's not inborn. It's taught. I as long as we, As long as the whiteies, I mean, I mean, excuse me. Longest white people 
are teaching hate. Mm -hmm. And we got some blacks doing it. Too long as I'll say long as humans are teaching hate, Mm -hmm. we're going to have more more gun violence. Fair enough, Rick. Thank you, man, for calling in. I appreciate it. Shouts out to uh, Chris McNulty. Thank you, sir. I see you. I'm doing well. Thank you for the the chance to get started here. Thank you. Thank you, man, for calling in. I appreciate it. Shouts out to uh, Chris McNulty. All right, there we go. Shouts out again. Thanks again. I hope, hope you're doing well, too, Chris. Uh, we're going to go to Ray, who's been on the line patiently waiting. Ray, thank you for calling in. Oh, no problem. All the way here from Grand Rapids. Thank um, you, sir. You know, you said you're talking about these, these kids and the and how it's 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 kind of nice that they're able to get their voice out there, mm-hmm. whether it's social media uh, however they're doing it. But but here's my problem with it. Okay. My problem is that it's not as if they're the only ones talking. Right. There are lots of kids out there with varying opinions. Mm-hmm. And the only ones we know about are the David Hogg kid and the girl <laughs> from the same school. Uh, he's going because... su- to be a superstar. David Hogg looked like he was made for TV, that guy. Right. And then, of course, doesn't look like she was, but she's loud. So that gets her on TV. But, but what's important is their message fits the message of CNN and MSNBC. It fits the message that they want to push. So, therefore, we get to see them on TV every, every two and a half minutes. Right. And it's not – and so I'm glad that kids understand that they have a voice and they have a right to speak. But I think that the media, is, the media forms it and, and uses it. And I'm tired. And these kids aren't aren't, aren't paying for the buses, okay? The, the school districts and parents mm-hmm. are pushing and helping to push, even though their ideas are based on emotion. Right. Well, that's, that, I think that's any, a part. And it would solve your problem. You just nailed it right on the head right there, Ray. I mean, I think that it would be quite natural for uh, a lot of parents that they just lost their kids or their friends lost, you know, their kids lost friends. That they would feel like they got to say something, do something. And I think that's what you like to say. A lot of it's running off raw emotion right now. And, and, and these emotional ideas, at least, at least the state legislature in Florida had enough common sense not to just shove something through real quick and make it happen because none of these, none of the things, nothing they wanted to do would solve any problems. You know, the Florida situation was 14 different people making a mistake. Right. That kid, if it had been reported properly, never would have had guns. If the FBI had let the local police know about their reports, if the if the mental health situation had been reported properly to the state, there's ten different ways. If four if four sheriff's deputies had gone into the building instead of waiting outside, there's a whole lot of things that went wrong here. And making the age uh, to buy a gun 21 was only one. You know that doesn't really solve most of the problem. It's a silly thing. There's a lot of these these ideas that seem logical, but in the end, all they do is restrict rightful gun owner and legal gun owner rights, which is, which is never the problem. And, and so that's the problem I have. I have a problem with anybody speaking their mind. I speak my mind all the time. I know you I do, have right? a problem with that. <laughs> but, but, and so do you, you know, I know how it is, but, but I have a problem with, with, with the, with ignorance being picked up and pushed. Right. And emotions and, and, and ideas based on emotion being picked up by people who want to push their agenda and pushing it all over the place. And, and that, that's why I have a problem with these kids that they see what's going on there. That, that, that the media disgusts me. Fair enough. Well, thank you, Ray. I appreciate you calling in all the way from Grand Rapids. Thanks for listening to the show today. All right, we're about to go to a break. When we come back, we're going to talk a little bit more about these possible gun laws and what's being put out there. You know, we're going to talk about a more controversial issue that I think that we don't talk about enough. I just want to get some insight from my listeners. It's about when wives beat their husbands, and no one wants to believe it. Oh, it's going to get spicy with this one, because my Facebook page proved the point on this whole issue. You're listening to The Wayne Bradley Show on 9, 10 a.m., your superstation, the future of radio. We'll be right back. Ten AM Superstation is the only place to get the best in talk radio from sunup to sundown. 
you have to get to the point that the, the most important voice that's in your head is your own. And if you can't stick on what the voice is inside your head, then you got to get the word down deep inside of you so that's what you can turn to. That's right. We wake you up with motivation at 5 a.m. What I've learned uh, life has its punches, life has its ups and downs, but don't stop moving. You know why? Because can't hit a moving target. And keep you entertained and enlightened all the way to 3 a.m. Don't believe me? Just listen. We are fortunate to have parents like Yolanda who never, ever stand down in the fight for having her children have a decent education. 9 10 a.m. Superstation. We are the future of radio. Nine Ten a.m. Superstation is launching a new initiative called the Nine Ten a.m. Ambassadors Program, where schools will be provided a platform to allow their inspiring broadcast and media students to weekly broadcast, highlighting their schools. All we will need is a sixty-second video taken from a smartphone, tablet, or video camera, highlighting a story at your school. Whether it's featuring one of your athletic teams, a student organization helping in the community, a student being chosen for a scholarship, or a teacher's unique approach to relating to students. Whatever weekly story will best show how your school is unique and set apart, that's what we want to promote. Your weekly video will be featured on all our social media platforms from Facebook to Instagram. To receive more information or speak with our ambassador representative, email us at 910amradio at gmail.com. And don't forget to watch and listen for your story soon on 910 AM Superstation, the future of radio. It's the Wade Bailey Show, conservative and lyrical radio, giving you what you need to know. This is the, it's the Wade Bailey Show. That's what it is. It's the Wayne Bradley Show. That's what it is. It's the Wayne Bradley Show. And welcome back to the Wayne Bradley Show live on 9 10 a.m. your Superstation, the future of talk radio. We're been, we've been having a good discussion here about these proposed different gun laws. Uh, President Trump actually said today, and I thought it was interesting, he told Congress, stop being scared of the NRA. We can cut a deal. Every now and then you actually have to fight them. I thought that was an interesting thing. He said he's a big fan of the NRA, and he, the NRA has been, a, I would consider, a pretty big supporter of Donald Trump. So we'll see how that works out. Uh, I think there's some some probably some small things that could be done that should not affect the the rights of the average uh, gun owner that wants to go and purchase another gun for protection for his home, or if he's an, a hunter, or if he's a collector, I don't, I don't see what, if those things are going to get in the way of that. Let's go to JJ, who's on the line. JJ, thanks for calling in. Hey Wayne, how you doing, Dave? All right, how you doing, JJ? All right, I want to touch on, touch on a couple of things. Somebody said it'd be like women's birth pains; they get closer together and more intense. Mm-hmm. And you know. You know the second coming is coming. All right, you get more intense and like women's birth pains. And what that one man said, hate. He also said, this same man said, you have heard, thou shall not kill. But if you have anger in your heart, you've already killed somebody. And that's what all these shootings were about: anger. Mm-hmm. The guy, that kid, was angry. His parents died. He was angry at the kids at school for maybe bullying him. Even that guy, you know, in Vegas, and I said this on Tired Courses show the day after that happened. Mm-hmm. I said that, that unrighteous mammon, that guy was losing $10,000 a day, and he was probably in his mind, that's your heart. Your mind is your heart and soul. In his mind, the evil casinos were taking $10,000 a day of his money, all right? And he probably thought, let me do something crazy over here so these people stop coming to these evil casinos. Okay. All right. But it, 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 it is an anger issue. It's a, it's a hatred. Anger turns to hate. Okay. And you're better off eating double cheeseburgers every day at McDonald's than have being angry at somebody. Hey, Jesus, tells us, 
to forgive, that's for our benefit. Because if you're angry at somebody, it eats you up. That causes high blood pressure, diabetes, all kinds of problems. And the other thing I want definitely, to definitely definitely easier to forgive and to not walk around with that burden of hate on you. There's no question about that. Right. That's why he he says forgive seventy times seven times a day. That's four hundred and ninety times a day, man. <laughs> forgive them. They know, they, they, brother. That's what got me through my whole life. Forgive them. They know not what they do. Amen. All right. Man. Amen. But 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 check this out. Mm-hmm. I want to talk about it. The NRA, they said they have 5 million members, okay? There's over 200 million gun owners in this country. Okay. The NRA, so that's only 2% of the gun owners belong to the NRA. Right. You know what I mean? Well, no. yeah, I know I know plenty of people that don't belong to any kind of association, uh, and they're gun owners. I mean, that's that's a luxury for a lot of people that buy guns to protect their homes. That's They do that for their home. They don't do it to be make a political statement, you know, and join the NRA and the Gun Owners Association of America and all those different things. Uh, you know, there's some discounts and value adds to it, but a lot of people don't do that. Right. One, one more point I want to make. So, anyways, we got to change people's minds, and they got to set their minds on, 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 on Jesus, basically. Mm-hmm. But the other thing with assault rifles, and I want you to check this out. See, people, they always talk about that. You know, we got to ban assault rifles. And I agree. Anybody that's taken a depression drug mm-hmm. should not be able to own any kind of gun. I don't I, care. I don't, have, yeah, I don't have a problem with that either. Mm-hmm. Okay. But but now, when if you remember Virginia Tech, mm-hmm. There was 32 people killed in a school, 32, almost twice as many as this last school. And he did that with a nine millimeter handgun he, with a pistol. Right. Okay. And, and actually a long gun, you know, I'm ex-military, a long gun is for a long shot, you know, a hundred yards, 200 yards, right? You know, two, uh, three, 600, a thousand foot shot. Okay. In a 30, 30 foot room, man, who, you want a pistol. Okay, so the next thing is that semi-automatic, that rifle is semi-automatic, a 9mm is semi-automatic. Same thing, I can shoot a 9mm just as fast as, as an AR-15, mm-hmm. okay, and, and, and twice as many. So if that's an assault rifle, a 9mm is an assault pistol. Mm. And, most people, and that's most what you people, say people see the correlation on that, huh, J.J.? Right, right. I, I mean, that, but, well, but, I think but, is what it comes down to is when you start giving the government more rights to take away stuff, they don't stop at that. They never stop at the one right. thing that they exactly. You know, that, that's, that's the bigger assault. issue. Right. Okay. We ban assault rifles because they kill people, but thousands of people die every year by nine millimeters. Yep. No, I agree. Every year. You know, so, but anyways, all right, my brother, you got to point things out to, to these uh, MSNBC and CNN listeners, man. All the, all the time. You know it. Thanks a lot, JJ, for calling in. Uh, all right. Shouts out to Ian Kyers, man. He's uh, checking in on the on the Facebook Live. You know you're always welcome to come on the show, brother. I would love to hear your platform and talk about your run here in the 13th Congressional District. It's a, it's a lot of folks getting in that race. I want to hear why you would be the best candidate, and I'm sure the listeners here on 910 would love that. So you're always welcome to my show, brother. You're always going to get a fair shot here. We don't do any – when you come in my home, we treat you right. You might have a t- couple of tough questions, but it's going to be a good, respectful interview. So you're always welcome to my show, brother. All right, let's go to Curtis. Curtis, welcome to the show. What's going on, man? All right, how you doing? I'm – I'm all right. Man, I was calling in because I was tripping on that post that you put on there yesterday about men actually getting beat by their wives. Uh, okay. You want, mean, so you want to chime in on that one, Curtis? <laughs> yeah, I definitely had to chime in on that. All I right. didn't know if that was really a thing, so I, I read the post, mm-hmm. and I was just like, wow. No, I mean, I, I, think, mean, I think what the reality is is that it happens. And guys just don't call. I mean, guys, technically, if you're not hurt or nothing, you're not going to call the police on your girlfriend. Like, it doesn't, girl, on the other hand, on the flip side of that, you can get into an argument with your lady and you can push her and she'll be like, oh, you touched me and call the police and you're going to jail. Guys just don't call. Naturally, I don't think most guys are going to call the police, period, on their, you know, because of all these different reasons, being ashamed to do so, you know, all that. It just, I don't think it, it, it's not reported that much. And in the article, it says, when wives beat their husbands, no one wants to believe it. And and I think that that's the, the bigger issue, you know? I think it's a respect thing. Any woman who has enough courage to put her hands on a, on, on a grown man, mm-hmm. 
I think she doesn't respect him as a man at all, in my opinion. Unless she unless she has done something that's deserving of getting you know, uh some her to go outside his head, like doing something ignorant when they go out all in another woman's face or something like that. That's worthy of being hit. But somebody while you just at home or y'all out on a date and or wherever and she just put her hands on you, it just it makes absolutely no sense to me that that she would just think so little of you like Well yeah, I mean it's the, it's, it's the ultimate of disrespect, but again it happens, and guys, like I said, guys, uh, they've even gotten used to it, and they didn't bother them if their woman hits hits them upside the head. I don't know, I, you know, whatever the scenario is. But the point is, they don't call the police. And in scenarios where they do call the police, if the man is not injured or something, you risk the ridicule of the, even the police officers. Like, oh man, come on, we got real exactly. situations out I here. Mean, you, but you're calling the police on. You don't really believe that they're deserving of ridicule. I mean, how can a woman be faithful to a man she has no respect for like that? Now, I find out if she's doing that. Well, if she's putting her hands want. on him anyway, she doesn't respect him, right? I mean, that's the whole point. Yeah. I mean, see, you're you're already taking it from the standpoint. That's weak for him to call the police on him. What kind of man lets it? But, see, that's the point. She's already put his hands on him, you know? You can't turn around and right. say – you can't be that way for a, a, a man. You can't put your hands on a woman – and then get mad at I'm her not, when she you going down you going that. to jail. But so it, it so the whole story was about does. equality. You know, nowadays we're talking about equality. So I guess that was all it right. was, Curtis. All right, all right, man. Well, thank you, you know. for chiming in. I appreciate you calling in, brother. All right, listen, man. I, I gotta, I gotta. I'm gonna go to David, and then I got a special guest. David, come on, let's take your call. Okay, Wayne. I want to discuss uh, the situation. I got the solution to deal with these uh, mass shootings, mm-hmm. such as the one happened in Florida, 17 kids that were killed. Right. You know you know what? Every state after this incident mm-hmm. needs to bring about the death penalty mm. for every state. Mm. Yes, indeed. Every state needs the death penalty. I'm an advocate for the death penalty. Mm. And this guy, he definitely, at, they need to have his trial as quickly as possible. I would say within the next four months. But, you know, that's the, rea- up. the reality in America is that the death penalty, it never moves that quick. A lot of these guys sit in jail for 10 to 20 years on appeals and Supreme, Supreme Court pe- appeals. Uh, and so while I understand the that would send the proper message in the, in the American court system, they don't execute them quick enough. Just to be quite honest, uh, well, do you know who was executed quick? Who was that? That mo- that, that sniper, that black Muhammad guy. Mm-hmm. Oh, he was executed like within like three months after he was convicted. Maybe he didn't appeal. You it. Maybe, that? maybe he didn't fight. I know who you're talking about. Maybe he didn't fight it. You know, there's a difference between again the legal system will allow for multiple appeals, multiple reasons to have it pushed back. Then you get political pressure. Uh, and so, I mean, you know, for example, Tukey, who was, in, was in, in, in California, was on death row for 20-plus years. I mean, you know, so my point is I understand the thinking behind that. If you can kill 17 people, uh, putting you in jail for life is not justice enough for me. In my it, it's not just. And I also want to say the guy who killed the 12 uh, black people in the church in South Carolina, mm-hmm. did he get the death penalty? Uh, I'm not sure if he got the death penalty yet. I'm not. I think they're still in court on that. I'm not sure. I have to check that out you know, for you. It, it, see, that's that's pathetic. He needs to be executed. South Carolina has the death penalty. And you know what? This is why I'm not. I'm boycotting. Black people should. I'm a person myself. I'm boycotting South Carolina. Mm. I'm not going to that state. <laughs> I got family members who live there and want to have a family reunion yeah. there, yeah. and I'm not going because I told them I'm boycotting your state. Twelve black folks killed in a church, and this man is, has, has not been sentenced for capital punishment. They, they picked him up Burger King on the way to the jail. You know, the and little, took him to Burger King, <laughs> and also the black the black Mikel, uh, Robert Burr who was dragged in Texas and decapitated. Mm-hmm. Those white men are still in prison. I don't even know if they got capital punishment. Well, like I said, they don't hand it out as, you know, a lot of times it's for the legal system, for the checks and balances. They just look for someone to plead guilty. 
uh, to a slightly lesser charge or make the deal. We won't pursue the death penalty if you plead guilty to it now. That's exactly what that young man uh, in Parkland, Florida is trying to do. He's just saying, I'll plead guilty to everything, just don't put me to death, which tells you a lot about this coward, that he would kill all those people, but he wants his life spared. So The, the, the state of Florida should not make that deal with him. Do not make that deal because this, this you you go, you you execute him. You want to send a message to everybody around the United States going to see this, and this going to uh, stop this crap. I you know he needs to go to the electric chair and execute. It was up to me, mm-hmm. man. I take that guy and I, I and I put him in a, a room or a cage with an anaconda. Mm. Well, That's he, how you would die. I feel you. Well, thank I, you. I leave it at that. Thank you, David. I appreciate it. You're welcome. All right. All right, now listen here, man. I I, I got to give this man. I got to give this man credit. You know, a lot of your elected officials, guys that are on the run right now, working hard to uh, run for office. They don't take. They don't make a quick call like this. I got to give it up. We're gonna have to get the, the round of applause up for this because a lot of the, a lot of elected officials don't have won't just call in like this. So I've got Sen- Senator Ian Kyers, who's also running for the Congress in the 13th district. Welcome to the Wayne Bradley Show. Can we get some applause? Wayne, Wayne, thanks for having us. I appreciate your time. I wanted to call in when I heard you were talking about uh, uh, the, the current state of uh, guns in America. Yes, yes. You know, that it's, it's an interesting conversation, and I, and I guess it would be good to get uh, your opinion on that, considering you're going to be running for Congress here in the 13th District. Uh, and, there, and Wayne County is one of the largest CPL holding communities in the country, Wayne County itself. So... What do you think that needs to be, in terms of responsible legislation, what do you think we could be doing differently right now? So specifically why I wanted to call in Mm -hmm. was to talk about uh, active response times in some of these crisis modes, whether it's a campus, Mm -hmm. whether it's the everyday shootings that happen in Detroit and have been honestly undeterred for the longest of times. Okay. uh, One of the main issues that I organize around, and you can Google this, before I was Senator Conyers, when I was just a guy knocking doors in the street, was the lack of ability of DPD to respond. Now, there's a technology out there called ShotSpotter. We are one of the only cities in America to not be fully deploying it. That technology allows our officers, and any time when there's a school shooting or there's an active shooter in the neighborhood or there's a place outside of you know, the major thoroughfares mm-hmm. to get that tech that get that update to their phone and rush to the scene with tactical data. You've got officers in DPD who are getting old data. They don't know where the shooter is. They don't know when it came in. They get a traditional 911 call. And we know, unfortunately, in Detroit, our 911 is at 10 percent of shootings. People wow. don't call. Right. There, you know, con- so what, is, what does this it? technology do? How, like, when the shots go off, is there some kind of technology? So, uh, you know, a shot goes off, it triangulates the data, it can pinpoint the accuracy. I mean, if you look at New York, Camden, Oakland, Memphis, Miami, all types of cities that had gun violence five, six years ago, southeast Washington, D.C., they have half and half again uh, the response times, and the crime and the shootings are going down. There's, there's, it has nothing to do with, with the gun owners. Mm-hmm. You see, right now, you saw the article that they celebrated Detroit having one less murder uh, or two less murders than we did the year before. That is a horrible way to tell the truth about what's happening in the neighborhoods. Of course, we have less shootings. We have less people. Hmm. And so the way we look at it as a state senator, I've introduced legislation to create a public-private fund for gunshot detection technology to help our officers get that technology they need to respond faster and to really take a dent out of the shootings that are happening. Now, we haven't had any of the school shootings, but as you know, outside of uh, the metrics of how many people got killed, we are the highest of illegal and unreported shootings in the country in the neighborhoods. Hmm. And do you know how I know that? How do you know that? The shot spotter that was rolled out on the east side of Detroit on Six Mile and Gratiot. Ooh, yes. It's still up and recording data, and DPD is not using it or paying for it. Well, that's interesting. I was going to say, how is it that, why wouldn't uh, DPD want this uh, technology? What, what, what would be the downside of this, or is it just cost prohibitive? I, I'm not sure. I would think it may be cost prohibitive, but at this point, 
when you're the only city to not embrace that technology, you've got to ask yourself why we don't want the real numbers getting out Mm. about just how many shootings are happening. Maybe from an economic development standpoint, that's not a comfortable conversation to have. Interesting. But you cannot address a problem, whether it's a, a, a foreign actor or a domestic actor, if you do not name it. And Detroit has a illegal shooting problem, highest in the country. Uh, if you look at the data from what I was just quoted in the Detroit News in 2016, that area has 2,700 events over the course of one year in three square miles with each event having over five rounds. Wow, yeah, that's the 48205. I know that area. That's the blood zone. (laughs) That means that if you extrapolate that over 139 square miles, there's over 600,000 bullets flying through the city of Detroit. There's a bullet for every citizen. Hmm. Interesting. I'm going to have to get Chief Craig. I'm going to have to get Chief Craig on here one of these days. We could talk about that. I just recently talked to him. So, as you, you know, and I guess I got I to gotta ask, one of these days I want you to come in and really sit down with us here. How, so far, how has it been on the campaign trail getting your message out? And with all the different, I got to ask, with all the different candidates in the race, what do you think you're going to do to establish yourself as the candidate here in the 13th District? Oh, well, thank you for the question. I appreciate it. We've been running and knocking doors and having parties and having events, uh, talking to the seniors, talking to the generations, just like I did in 2016. Um, You know, last time around, the cameras weren't on. Mm -hmm. It was a local race. But we had some great competition. Uh, I ran against a lot of former state legislators, uh, particularly Mr. Fred Durrell Jr., who uh, gave us a wonderful race. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he was no joke. He was the dean of the Michigan House. Right. Uh, And we we respect him a lot. And, when we got out there, the, the the seniors had the choice between someone with a little bit of legislative experience and someone with not so much, like myself. Right. And the, the seniors chose to put in the rookie. I think what we're hearing out there is they want uh, the energy, someone that can go back and forth between Washington, D.C. and Detroit right. uh, and get to work on day one. Right. And I've offered up my experience of having gone to school in D.C. and worked in D.C. and organized for President Obama before I came home. Right. Uh, And folks are very excited about that. And also, right now I represent about a third of the city of Detroit. Mm -hmm. So I have Van Dyke on the east side, run along eight miles to Schaefer on the west side, down through Russell Woods, West Grand Boulevard, and the Boynton neighborhood. But I've also got Lincoln Park, Allen Park, and Southgate. Another another part of the contingents of uh, the 13th district, the parts that are outside the Detroit area. Right. And when you look at the congressional district, it's not only Detroit, but it's also Redford, Ecorse, Melvindale, River Rouge, Garden City, Westland, Wayne, uh, and and cities who have their own identity. I think they understand they need someone who's represented Detroit, Mm -hmm. but can also listen and execute on their issues. Uh, And we're, we're offering that vision. So I'm very excited to go over the next 162 days if you're counting. All right. All right. Well, for people that are listening, uh, and they want to find out more information about you. What's your website, and where can they go to find out more information about you? We're at ian dot com, and that talks about all of our events that will be happening as well as what I have done since being a state senator. I think it's so important for people to read the bills that you yourself as a legislator authored. I totally, I totally agree. A lot, a lot of people don't know that a lot of their, some of their legislators don't know how to get a bill. Uh, down without help so I, i'm impressed with that and uh i definitely would love to have you come on so we could have more time I, this is like my power hour on mondays but <laughs> i would definitely love to have you come on soon because i've been talking about this 13th district i think it's interesting i i you know i have some more interesting questions down the road but there's so many folks in that race are you are you are, is anyone concerned i guess like jonathan kenlocker do you think people are concerned that someone like a bill wild who's outside detroit can end up winning this seat I think uh, we take every competitor seriously. Mm -hmm. Um, I believe uh, someone from Detroit who understands our out-county areas and who has been committed to the 13th district Mm -hmm. will have the best chance of winning this. I feel so confident because I come out of the district. Uh, Before running for state rep and state senate, I served as the treasurer of the congressional district. And before that, I was a volunteer. And unless you showed up at those meetings, 
to know our people, know our activists, know our grassroots folks, you're going to have a tough time getting their support. Amen to that. Well, I look forward to having you come on. And, again, thank you because, like I said, a lot of elected officials don't come on on the fly like that. So I definitely appreciate you coming on the show. It shows that you don't have anything to hide, and I like that. So you're always welcome on here uh, to come on and talk about your, your campaign. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, sir. Talk to you soon, Wayne. Have a blessed evening. All right. Well, that's I, I, can, I can really appreciate that. That is the idea of how your public servant should be. He was watching, uh, tuning in on Facebook. And Senator Conyers uh, called in, and I, I really appreciate that. We'll definitely have him on soon. Uh, he's definitely, uh, you know, at the at the forefront of, the, of candidates in that 13th district. So we'll see what's going on. Thank you again. All right, let's go to Andrew. Andrew, thanks for calling into the show today. Good. How you doing? All right. Question for you, and I, I assume you're aware of it. What about the statement at the CPAC? conference that uh was made about uh <laughs> i've had a couple calls field. on this yeah i, I just I, what, I addressed it earlier listen you. this guy who made the comment and i'll say this again this is why i really don't do cpac as much as i used to because you have a lot of these libertarians and guys that don't understand uh politics it was an ignorant statement uh michael Steele had been involved with uh republican politics for decades by the time he became chairman uh, now, did it help the fact that at that time that he was black? I'm sure it could have played a small factor in it, but the man had deserved, uh, through hard work, he earned that position as chairman of the party. Uh, and it's disrespectful. Uh, and, again, would they say that about um, Betsy DeVos or would they say that about Ronald McDaniel, that they only got it because they're a woman? Uh, no, that, again, this is that's meant to cause division. Uh, and it wasn't a true statement, and it has been res- uh, disputed and refuted by including uh, the RNC chairman today, Ronnie McDaniel, at the uh, Trailblazers dinner and uh, luncheon in D.C. Uh, it was an ignorant why? statement, and uh, I can't defend ignorance. Why would uh, Slaffy, Mark Slaffy, you're aware of him, right? Why would he try to defend that? And he even who tried who tried to defend it. Mark Slaffley, I believe his name was. Just, it was just on a few minutes ago they were replaying. Well, listen, I, like I said, that I and think he's a conservative, so he wasn't a, a radical. I mean, you got him. people out here that want to defend ignorance. That's just, I mean, because they have a, a a base of people that that might appease them to hear that that phrase. But the reality was at the time, uh, and Michael Steele at the time led some of the highest numbers in fundraising. He was oh, part definitely. of part of the reason that the Tea Party came into action in the Republican Party. Uh, so uh, he brought he, his contributions. Uh, Marco Rubio came in at that time. Uh, Alan West. I mean, you know, but Tim you Scott. I'm, I'm aware of him. I was just asking. I no, I mean, I, I, I can't defend it. All I can say is it was, is ignorant uh, and that, you know, these kind of people need to be refuted and not be, be, even be put in a situation uh, as a communications director or anything else. I think since that time he has apologized. Uh, but the thing, that's just an ignorant statement, and uh, I, I haven't spent too much time talking about it because uh, um, not the majority of Republicans walk around feeling that way. You got some guys, okay, you have some guys that feel that way, uh, but that's not that does not represent the overall values and the people in our party, and uh, and I don't treat it as such. So I'll give a little bit of time to that kind of ignorance, but it's just a dumb statement to make. Was uh, you think the? Uh the Tea Party group, where you think they were a positive uh, thing with Steele, or how do you feel? Now, I don't blame him one way or the other. Oh, no. He, um, did. he brought in a lot of good people, and he helped I think, I think overall it was good for the, the Republican Party in general. I think that uh, too often, a lot of, at, at that time, a lot of politicians, and it's still, you know, Trump was the, you know, the Tea Party was the beginning of the dissatisfaction with the average politician that was just in there taking up space and donald trump was the exclamation point on it uh and you know some of it was fostered out of their frustration with president obama or whatnot but it was more about the fact that the tea party really started when we gave the bailouts to the banks you know and it just it was taxpayer money being given back to wealthy corporations and the people on the ground were not getting bailouts we weren't getting bailed out of our houses we weren't getting bailed out of our are bad situations, and, and, you know, people got tired of that. And I think that uh, overall now you have a, a certain caucus of, of Republicans that uh, stand still, stand true to those principles, and it might be harder to get certain deals done, uh, but I, I do respect uh, most of those gentlemen that are in that Freedom Caucus. 
Uh, especially my guy, then, Justin Amash out of Michigan. Yeah, quick, quick question. I'll be done. Do you believe, and if not, what would be the alternative if the banks haven't been bailed out? Should they have failed? And, and uh, no, I mean, I think that no, I think that what should have been done is that it should have been also some more, it should have been more balanced out. If, our, if taxpayers are paying it, uh, there should have been some sort of bailout. If, if you're going to bail out banks, why wouldn't you help bail out the people that are keeping those banks afloat as well in terms of customers? Why weren't some of these fees that they put in place and all the things that they make money off of it that really go after your poorest banking members, all these things are still going on. So, no, and I think that that, and that's not a black thing or a white thing. That's a money. A mo- yeah, no, that's what I'm saying. That's a money, a have and a have not issue. And, uh, and I think that a lot of Tea Party people were smart enough, even some of the Tea Party people who had money could look at that objectively and say, our government is screwing over the little guy. And they're not even so we, and they're not even sticking to constitutional values of what they were elected for. Too many guys are coming in politicking on we're going to reduce the size of government, we're going to limit government, and doing exactly the opposite once elected. So to me, uh, again, I'm not a Republican or a Democrat. I'm, I'm more, I try to be independent. Mm-hmm. So when I what you just said to me rings true because when I listen to Rand Paul. You know, he made that's more my guy. if you're talking about a conservative. Oh, that's my know? guy right there. I'm, all, I'm always going to stand with Rand, always. And my last, last comment, if I could, when I hear, and again, it's no knock to anybody, mm-hmm. and I get please don't, hope don't take it there. When I hear people, and mm-hmm. especially blacks lately, they holler, I'm a black conservative. Do they really know what a conservative is, and do they really practice it? Or is it just a good buzzword for them to think that this is say it, a black why not be a, a black um, Republican well, I mean, moderate? I mean, that's fine. I, I don't like any of those labels. I think that and you, you, you okay. paint yourself in a corner because, right. uh, cons- like you said, conservatives, some people, I can't lie to you, it's confusing to me nowadays to see what some people who call themselves conservatives uh, and they're from bigger and more overreaching government. Uh, you have some conservatives don't have a problem with exerting government over something they don't believe in, whether it's uh, you know, yeah. medical marijuana, whether it's, you know, whatever the cause is, whatever it is yeah. uh, they don't mind inflicting the government. If they are against um, gay marriage, they didn't have a problem with the, uh, you know, church and state, you know, government getting involved in that. Uh, when it wasn't a government issue in the first, it should have never been a government issue in the first place. So while you might okay. not agree with it, you know, again, Rand Paul is the most consistent guy in Washington, right. D.C., period. Consistent. Yeah, I don't agree with a lot of his things, but he's very consistent. Yeah, I don't, I don't agree that. with everything he does, but I think, you know, when he does something, I already saw it coming, and I knew that that was where he was going to stand because he's consistent on his uh, values yeah, he, and the way he votes and uh, the message he puts out there. So, no, he's a different, he's so a different kind of guy. Okay, he, you can respect him. I can respect him. I not agree with him on a lot of things, but I do respect his, you know. Got, his, got, his got, to, respect, got to respect Rand Paul, definitely. Thanks a lot, Andrew. All right, we got this last call here. Chad, thank you for calling in. Hello, how you doing, Mr. Bradley? All right, how yes, you doing? I'm, all right, I, I just want to say that um, I'm sorry, I, 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 I just don't have too much, um, you know, uh, confidence in, you know, the Conyers' um, legacy or, or the members. I know they don't speak for, you know, John Conyers or whatever, but I'll just tell you, I've, I've had some very bad experiences with with John, with Mr. Conyers' um John Conyers administration when I was in need mm-hmm. and help of a person whose family and, and you know, dad have and you know, relatives and a lot of politicians really supported, you know, uh, the you know, the Conyers, uh, you know, John Conyers and and I've been rudely talked to from some of their staff when I call and stuff and nobody never got back with me. So I hate to say it for what it's worth and and that's my opinion how it sounds seem like a lot of these black politicians uh-huh. The Democrats, they when they get them positions, they always forget where they come from, and all they do is give a bunch of lip service, and it's the same old rhetoric. Mm. You know, I, I, I hate to well, say that. Well, you I know, to, so to the— a, a, a Republican. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? It would be know. something if we could see a Republican in that seat, but— uh we got we got a lot of work to do before we can get a Republican in that seat, Chad. But thank you for calling in today. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow from seven to nine. Uh, again, this is the Power Hour on Mondays. I appreciate everyone that was listening in today. Shouts out to Donald Snyder. I see you watching on Facebook. We'll be back tomorrow from seven to nine. If you get a chance and you want to download it, go to iTunes and download the Wayne Bradley Show. You can also get it on SoundCloud or go to the website conservativebro.com. That's again, that's conservativebro.com. 
And follow me on Twitter at Conservative Bro. It's been fun. You're listening to The Wayne Bradley Show on 9, 10 a.m. Your Superstation. Peace. President Obama, over the last eight years, in your mind, has race, have race relations improved under his leadership? I, you know, race relationships have to do with race relationships. You're white or whatever you are. I'm black or whatever I am. We're standing here talking now. That's how we get things done. You can't legislate love. The president of the United States can't legislate us into liking each other. We have to step forward and ask questions about each other and engage. There's no law that says, oh, because I'm president, you all got to get along now. So it's up to us. We live in America, and in America we have the freedom to express ourselves. We shouldn't take that for granted. So whatever the movements are, whether you agree with them or don't, they have the right to express themselves. So that's one of the great things about being in this country, that you do have the right to protest. 9, 10 a.m. Superstation. We are the future of radio. 9, 10 a.m. Superstation has arrived, and we're here to stay. We've got the topics, the guests, the opinions, and the facts. Wells Fargo, you might have heard of them. They just got hit with a, a set of fines of $185 million. And why did they get fined all of this money? They had literally thousands, mind you, of their employees who were caught setting up fake, fake bank accounts, naming customers who were actual customers as the bank account holder without the customer even knowing that there was an account in their name. But it wasn't just that, okay? All of a sudden, things were going on with these accounts, and fees were being added, and those fees... Fees were, of course, going to the bank. And the people who didn't even know that they had bank accounts all of a sudden are finding that they're being charged these fees. Now, some people look at their statements when they come in, and so they kind of kind of figured it out somewhere along the way. Other people don't always look at their bank account statement. 9, 10 a.m. Superstation. We are the future of radio. There's always something new to talk about, and 9, 10 a.m. Superstation wants to have you covered from every angle. Roy McAllister, he's in the building. What's up, Roy? Pastor Moore, thank you so much. I want to rehash a little bit about the green light. Well, the, the first thing is the fact that the uh, green light initiative started in District 2 at the Marathon gas station over on um, uh, Wyoming and Six Mile. If somebody sees something, they will not engage in any type of activity. It's not the fact that it's, it's wrong on one side, right on the other side. What we have to do is we have to come together. Green light, it's okay for what it is, but if you're going to just say the green light is used as a deterrent or to make a store station safer, it, it would make a person think about it. But don't say the green light is, is stopping crime as a, as a source to fight crime. You're not fighting crime. What you're doing really is pushing crime down the block. That criminal-minded person is still out there looking for a victim. 9, 10 a.m.